Uh, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you on this, the 500th anniversary of the consecration of that most remarkable of buildings, the Lady Chapel of Westminster Abbey, constructed under the supervision of Abbot John Islip. Um, to be precise, the anniversary is tomorrow, uh, but this was as close as we could get. On the 4th of February, 1742, William Aldis is presented for inspection at an ordinary meeting of the learned fellows of the Society of Antiquaries at the Mitre Tavern in Fleet Street. An old drawing upon vellum with a pen, about five feet long and one foot broad, made in honor of John Islip, abbot of Westminster, a man in great favour with Henry the Seventh and a great benefactor to the said Abbey. He died January th 1532, the beginning of King Henry the Eighth, which is something of a stretch in the definition of the word beginning, I would have thought. Um, and soon after his death, this drawing was made. The antiquarian William Aldous was at this time in somewhat straitened circumstances and was working primarily for various booksellers. Until eight months previously, he had been the literary secretary of Edward Harley. But on Harley's death on the 16th of June, 1741, Aldous was forced to take what bibliographical work he could find, and was in fact eventually reduced to such penury that 10 years later, his debts drove him into the Fleet Prison, from which he was only rescued by the generosity of friends. The curiosity that Omnis presented to the antiquaries in 1742 was what we now know as the Islip Roll, an exquisite mortuary roll drawn up to mark the death of John Islip, Abbot of Westminster, which had actually happened on Sunday the 12th of May, 1532. This roll, which now resides among the monuments of Westminster Abbey, features a wonderfully delicate and accomplished set of drawings in pen and ink on vellum two of which provide us with the only pre-dissolution views of parts of the interior of the Abbey, including the High Altar. As such, they are historically extremely important, as well as being artistically significant. <coughs> abbot Eisler, the subject of the Montreal, Roll, was the last great abbot of Westminster. He was born on the 10th of June, 1464, in Islip in Oxfordshire, a village that had had a long and close association with Westminster Abbey, for it was here that Edward the Confessor had been born at the beginning of the 11th century, and it was a manor which the, that king had granted to the Abbey, and which the Abbey had held ever since. The future abbot was probably, in fact, the son of Nicholas Barton and his wife Isabella, the local millers. But his potential must have been spotted at a young age, quite possibly by the then abbot of Westminster, John Eastney. Young John Barton was clothed as a Benedictine monk in 1480, adopting the toponym Islip in recognition of his origins. He rose swiftly through the church hierarchy, becoming chaplain to Abbot Eastney in 1487, and rapidly taking on various administrative roles within the abbey, cellarer in 1496, and soon afterwards receiver, treasurer, and monk bailiff. In 1498, he was involved in the Abbey's claim to be the proper burial place for Henry VI, a claim which, although legally successful, ended up a practical failure. Henry VI's body remained at Windsor. In the same year, he was elected prior, the second highest position within the Abbey. And only two years later, at the age of only 36, he was chosen to succeed the brief abbacy of George Fascid. Islip's rule as abbot was a high point for Westminster Abbey. Islip had significant influence at court with both Henry VII and Henry VIII, and was close to most of the major figures of the day, many of whom, including the king, came to dine at the abbot's lodgings. He was appointed to various royal commissions and fulfilled other administrative roles. He was employed, for example, in the divorce proceedings of Henry VIII in the 1520s. But his major achievements, for which he will probably be best remembered, were architectural. The Chantry Chapel in the Abbey which bears his name, 
and especially overseeing the construction of the new Lady Chapel, one of the most splendid buildings in the country, whose foundation stone was laid on the 24th of January 1503 and whose consecration came 13 years later. As an artistic patron then, like Abbot Eastley before him, his was an edifice complex. Architecture and his buildings were clearly his chief interest. Nonetheless, a somewhat crude book of, book of devotions of his does survive in the John, John Ryland's library. Um, in it, alongside an interesting split pomegranate, which you can see at the bottom, it would be good to know more of his relationship with Catherine Barron, he has had introduced his own grievous, of which he is clearly very fond. <laughs> Whether this demonstrates a particularly cultivated sense of humour is open to debate. An eye alongside a slip of a plant. Eye slip. This device is to be found again and again throughout the Abbey, notably on his Chantry Chapel. The eye and the slip. Or sometimes, in a variant of it, an eye and a man slipping out of a tree. In quarries in windows both at the Abbey and elsewhere. <laughs> Here's rather a nice example from the Church of St. Mary in Little Chesterfield in Essex. Abbot Bicelip's death on the 12th of May 1532 and his funeral four days later were major events. The long procession which accompanied his body included senior ecclesiastical figures, heralds and nobles. There is a detailed account of the proceedings in a manuscript of the College of Arts. Incidentally, the presumably heraldic author of this account, had almost certainly seen the Islip roll, judging by the arms he chooses to illustrate the heading, of which more in a moment. The requiem mass at Islip's funeral was conducted by the abbot of Bury St Edmunds, and the vicar of Croydon, the notorious Roland Phillips, preached the sermon. It is not necessarily surprising, therefore, that a mortuary roll, that is, a roll designed to inform others of the death of a senior ecclesiastical figure, was also drawn up to mark the occasion. The roll is made up of five panels over three membranes. These depict in sequence, um, and I've included here both a straight photograph of the original on the left, and a black and white photo taken some time ago under UV light as the delicacy of the draftsmanship in the original simply doesn't show up clearly from a distance. Um, I tested this the other day and it doesn't. Um, and I thought this might make it easier to make a level of detail. So, Abbot Islip standing amongst the virtues is the first one. The abbot on his deathbed at his abbatial residence in Lanate, a short distance from the abbey in what is now Pimlico, the funeral of the great man, showing his magnificent catafalque before the high altar in Westminster Abbey. His chantry chapel, which he himself had had constructed in readiness for his death, and which is architecturally very much as we still see it today, um, although the artist has removed the front wall to enable us to see inside. Um, and it also uh, includes Islip's own tomb mon monument since lost. And finally, a decorate. There's the, the chapel as it is today. And finally, a decorated initial U, presumably intended to open the word universities or something similar, and thereafter to be followed by the text of the mortuary roll, which has not been written out, leading many people to suggest that for one reason or another the roll was simply unfinished. This initial contains an image of the abbot assisting at the coronation of Henry VIII, with the exterior of the abbey set over it, with building work in progress, on, um, in progress on the west end. On either side, the abbot issuing or possibly receiving a document, and on the right, a monk passing the document, possibly a different one, perhaps meant to be this mortuary roll, to a messenger. In 1742, when Olmus displayed it, the role was actually in the possession of a certain William Green, a sculptor from Wakefield, who, the Society's minutes record, is desirous of committing it to the inspection of the learned and ingenious Society of Antiquaries for their judgment and advice, 
through the hands and care of William Aldous, who was desired to accept the Society's thanks. By the following spring, Green was attempting to sell the manuscript, still closely advised, one cannot help but imagine, by Aldous. The manuscript had been in William Green's possession for a number of years, since at least 1728, and it had clearly interested him enough to make a copy of at least one of its panels, that of Isaac Among the Virtues. He has the original alongside it. This drawing is now amongst the goth papers of the Bodleian. When it was put on display before the Antiquaries in 1742, the Isaac Roll clearly struck a chord with at least one of the learned fellows who saw it. The Society's official engraver, George Virtue, evidently remembered having seen something similar, and was soon in correspondence on the subject with his friend John Anstis, Garter King of Arms. The letters that pass between them are among Virtue's papers at the BL in additional manuscript 23088. Two of those which Anstis sent to Virtue from his house in Mortlake were also copied into the Society's minutes the following May. The first of these, dated 30th November 1742, is worth quoting. Sir, I likewise send you the drafts relating to Abbot Islip's death and funeral, which probably you might formerly have seen in my custody, which I brought from Warwickshire long ago. The first part contains his expiring in a large room, not in probably Jerusalem chamber. Anstis is wrong there. With the emblems of the four evangelists at the corner. The second is his body under the hearse or chapel ardent in the Abbey of Westminster, with the attendants, etc. The third is monument which still remains, etc. These two latter show the decorations of the figures there in the Abbey. I have the heraldic narrative of his funeral from a manuscript of that time, presumably the College of Arms manuscript that we just saw. I shall send them at any time if the Society have not already seen it, and if thought deserving engraving, that may be done. Four months later, on the 25th of April 1743, Anstis followed this up with another letter, apologising for not yet having sent the drafts from Mortlake to Virtue, a misfortune occasioned by the sickness of his waterman, now lately dead. <laughs> Anstis explained that he had undertaken a somewhat drastic intervention on the drawings he had acquired. It was in a long roll, miserably ill-used, before I put it into frames and got it to be repaired in several places. But I'm afraid these amendments decreased the value of it. Quite. <laughs> what exactly these drawings, or drafts, were that were in Anstis's possession, and which he had had cut up and put into frames, would not have been terribly clear, except that George Virtue took up the offer of making copies. The drawings that Virtue made have recently been discovered, once more among the Goth papers at the bottom. And here I must express my profuse thanks to Bernard Nurse, who will be known to most of you, for first bringing them to my attention and for discussing their significance with me. The drawings that Virtue copied were coloured and are an entirely separate set from that which now constitutes the Iceland Royal. The Anstis panels, as I better refer to them, were clearly very close to the drawings on the existing roll as we know it. But there are sufficient differences to make clear that the originals in Anstis's possession were not simply straight or indeed later copies. In fact, it seems clear that they must have been the portions of the finished coloured mortuary roll for which the isolate roll that we have represents an initial, if highly polished, preparatory drawing. If that is so, then the virtue drawings that we have here, that are at the Bodleian, represent the only genuine coloured representation of the pre-dissolution Abbey in existence. And as such, offer fascinating new evidence of how the Abbey looked and was furnished in the late medieval period. I think we may take Virtue's drawings as constituting an accurate representation of Anstis's original panels. Virtue was, of course, a highly accomplished draftsman, and both well able and indeed under specific instructions to record things precisely for antiquarian comparison. There would have been no reason for him to embellish or invent, and quite a strong pressure not to. 
Before looking in more detail at what evidence the new pictures give us for the circumstances of the creation of the mortuary roll and its purpose and what it shows us of the Abbey interior, it will be as well to finish covering the history of the two manuscripts that we now, has been happening as far as I've been able to establish them. John Anstis himself stated that he had acquired his drawings in Warwickshire long before. Although this doesn't give us much to go on, it's notable that a large proportion of the collection he owned had come from that of the Herald Sir Edward Walker, who died in 1677 and had lived the latter part of his life at Clopton in Warwickshire. It seems to me quite possible that the coloured roll, that is, Anstice's panels, had been in Walker's possession in the late 17th century, and so possibly, as many other papers had, might have come before that from the Ridesley family, by Sir William Dethick and Sir William Lenin. This is all conjectural, but a great many other manuscripts did follow this route, and Thomas Ridesley, of course, was guard king of arms in 1532 at the death of Abbot Islip, although he was not apparently present at the funeral. What happened to these coloured panels after John Anstice's death in 1744 is unfortunately not clear. His papers were kept by his sons until the last of these died in 1678, the 1768, sorry whereupon they were auctioned off in 656 lots. Unfortunately, there is no specific mentions of drawings of Abbot Islip's funeral among the sales particulars. The only entry in which it seems such drawings might lurk appears to be lot number 555, which includes a portfolio with some of the prints engraved by the Society of Antiquaries, catafants of several great men and other prints. It, it does specify print, it's not a written drawing, so. The annotated copy of the sales catalogue in the College of Arms indicates that this lot was purchased by Joseph Edmondson. And you can just see this on the left there, Edmund. Um, it's slightly cropped, I'm afraid. Who was formerly the Queen's coach painter. And later, after much wrangling with a number of me the members of the College of Arms, a herald extraordinaire. Mark Noble, in his History of the College of Arms of 1804, described Edmondson as, from humble origins and a mean trade, rose to celebrity. He was apprenticed to a barber, became afterwards a herald painter, and being employed much in emblazoning arms upon carriages, he took a fancy to the science of heraldry. In 1767, Garter King of Arms Stephen Martin Leake was rather blunt in his description, saying that he was a low, dirty mechanic. <laughs> who, who by obsequiousness had insinuated himself into the favour of science and ability. An alternative possibility is that the colour panels remained in the possession of George Virtue. John Anstis died very soon after lending them to Virtue, and it's conceivable that Virtue never got around to returning them. If so, they should have remained among his papers, which are scattered. But many of his drawings were acquired by Horace Walpole, and now form part of the Lewis Walpole collection in Farmington. But there seems to be no sign of the Islip paintings among them, as far as I've been able to establish. Whether the original coloured panels were acquired by Edmondson, or remained or re retained by virtue, or ended up elsewhere entirely, unfortunately no trace of them has yet been found up to the mid-18th century. The Islip roll itself, that is the one that we have at Westminster, Hawked for sale by William Green in 1743, was eventually bought by Robert Hay Drummond, later to become Archbishop of York, but at this point a newly installed prebend at Westminster. In 1747, four years later, with typical generosity, Drummond donated the role to the Dean and Chapter of Westminster. His sixth son, George, said of him that wherever he lived, hospitality presided. Wherever he was present, elegance, festivity, and good humour were sure to be found. His very failings were those of a heart warm, even to impetuosity. Some 40 years later, the then Dean, John Thomas, once again loaned the curious old drawing upon vellum to the antiquaries to put it before the fellows, this time in their relatively new rooms in Somerset House. The Dean believed it to be by Holbein, and the minutes give a detailed description of the document, taken almost verbatim from the description of it in 1742-3. However, a final flourish is given on the significance of this curious old manuscript. Abbot Islip, say the minutes, laid the first stone of Henry VII Chapel in 1502, 
And dying in 1532, this drawing becomes the more valuable because it not only represents the form of the hearse and the ceremonial and manner of performing the obsequies in that age, but also shows the structure and, high, and appearance of the high altar in Westminster Abbey before the Reformation. And further shows the original appearance and ornaments of Islip's chapel and the figure placed under his tomb, which is now destroyed. Three years later, in 1787, the Society petitioned the Dean to allow Mr. Grimm, that is the artist Samuel Grimm, to copy for the use of the Society the drawings by Hans Holbein of Islip's funeral in his Lordship's possession. No response seems to have been forthcoming. And so, four years later, in February 1791, it was minuted that the Secretary do wait upon the Bishop of Rochester, that is the Dean, to obtain permission of his Lordship to have a copy of the drawing of Hans Holbein of Islip's funeral, and to request that the Society may have the use of the drawing for that purpose. This second petition evidently was successful, for Samuel Grimm was paid 30 guineas by the Society in May 1791 for six drawings taken by him from a role in the possession of the Dean of Westminster of Islip's funeral. The drawings that Grimm made of the role are now in the Society's collections upstairs, in the red Westminster Abbey portfolio. Number 19, Isaac Among the Virtues. Number 20, The Deathbed. 21, The Funeral. 22, Isaac Chapel. And 15E, The Initial U. The sixth drawing, coloured and labelled six by Grimm, was of Isaac's arms, that had come out terribly well. 15D in the portfolio, which seems to have been taken from the Parliament Roll of, Ar Parliament Roll of Arms, now British Library, Additional Manuscript 40078. The intention had clearly been to make engravings of the individual drawings, not the drawings on the Islip Roll, but for some reason this project took another 13 years to come to fruition. Why this delay occurred is not entirely clear, but it may help to explain why, resting in the society's strong rooms through this period, the Roll's precise origins came to be rather forgotten. James Bazarow finally produced five engravings from the Grimm drawings of the role for, the, for volume four of the Society's Vitus de Monumenta in 1809, for which he was paid the princely sum of 83 guineas, exclusive of copper and writing. But the role itself was then forgotten and was not returned to the Dean of Chapter as it should have been. In fact, it not only sat in Somerset House, but indeed was moved with other collections here to Burlington House in 1874 until it was rediscovered by W. St. John Hope, who published an investigation of the role, the only detailed study thus far in Fatusta Monumenta, Volume 7. The, the role was finally returned to the Dina chapter on the 31st of January, 1907, 120 years after it had been borrowed. <laughs> <laughs> it has remained in the Munich of the Abbey since that date. <laughs> In 1953, it was exhibited at the Royal Academy in an exhibition of Flemish art, at which point a detailed examination of the role was carried out. It was only then that the attribution to Holmwein was dropped, and an alternative, author an alternative authorship of Gerard Horenwood put forward by Otto de Pacht. This attribution was supported by A.U. Popham, Keeper of Prince of Drawings at the British Museum, and by Edward Croft Murray, and has not since been challenged. The role itself will feature in the planned Queen's Diamond Jubilee Galleries at the Abbey due to open in early 2018, although because of light sensitivity, we will probably only be able to display one panel at a time with a facsimile of the others. So, back to the mortuary role itself. First of all, we can scotch a tentative suggestion made by St. John Hope. St. John Hope was intrigued by the escutcheons which are to be found on the panel of Islip Among the Virtues. As you can see, and I've included here both the original roll on the left and Virtue's drawing of the coloured panel so that you can see what I'm referring to more clearly, the abbot is shown standing among coils of foliage with scrolls bearing the Christian virtues, managing incidentally to incorporate another allusion to his rebus. He holds a slip of, plant, of a plant in both hands. But the Virtue's picture also contains six escutcheons around the abbot, held by supporting angels. Five of the coats of arms depicted are straightforward, 
and were straightforwardly explained by St. John Hope as working around clockwise from the top left. The arms of St. Edward the Confessor, the founder of the Abbey, the arms of St. Peter, to whom the church is dedicated, the royal arms, the arms of the Abbey, and the personal arms adopted by Abbot Islip himself. These last arms also appear frequently in his Chantry Chapel, for example. However, the sixth arms on the left here caused St. John Hope some trouble. He suggested that they were the arms of the Giles family, but he said the connection of this with the abbot has yet to be made out, although he did note that St. Giles is one of the prominent figures of saints in the deathbed scene. In fact, the arms depicted are those of abbot of Abbot Islip's predecessor but one as abbot, John Eastney. They appeared on his monumental brass, which still sits in the North Ambulatory, outside the chapel of St John the Evangelist, immediately to the west of Islip's own chapel. Only indents of the arms now survive. However, Henry Keep, writing in 1683, when they were still there, recorded them on a fencing rail between three crosses patterned with three markers. In a similar arrangement to the Islip roll, Eastney's brass also included the arms of St. Peter and of the Abbey, and at least one other, which Keep does not identify, but which one would imagine might well have been the confessor's arms, I would have thought. As we have seen, John Eastney was abbot when Islip first came to the Abbey in 1480, and was very much Islip's patron. It is interesting to note that Islip seems to have adopted arms with a marked similarity to Eastney's, presumably as a sign of debt to his master. But it is also worth noting the inclusion of this specific relationship, that of Islip's patron, the person who was abbot when Islip arrived at the abbey, and who was responsible for promoting him through the various offices of the monastery, and to whom he served as personal chaplain. Its inclusion on the role in 1532 may have more significance than the purely historical echo of biographical, biographical events from 50 years before, again, a point I shall come back to. <coughs> I'm afraid it's not my intention here to explore all the additional details that the colour the virtue coloured versions of the original Anstis panels reveal about the architectural and decorative interior of Westminster Abbey before the dissolution. That must remain as the subject for much further study and probably one to be taken up by others, possibly by some of you in this room. For now, I shall only highlight one or two specific details, some of which, in fact, George Virtue himself enumerated in a memorandum among his papers drawn up on the instructions of the Society. On the first panel, for example, that of Islip among the virtues, George Virtue states that the escutcheons and the inscription in Quiro Parco Mit Persa, Persa Quare Aeal is wanting entirely in those I have compared with from Mr. Ansis. And B, it appears by some little remains that such an illuminated partition of this figure of Abbot Islip was joined to that of Mr. Anstis's, but had been cut off and is wanting now, but may ha be happily supplied by this role. That is, virtue has here filled in the blank. On the third panel, he states that every circumstance of the delineation is so much alike that excepting the colour coloured blazoning of the coats of arms that adorn the funeral hearse and some inserted mottos, it is all the same. In fact, we can see on this panel that there are extra figures introduced onto the colour version the bottom right, and indeed on the other side of the high altar. Only two steps rather than three are in front of the high altar. That a great deal more detail is available as to the polyptic or painted table above the high altar, you see it behind. That a motto has been introduced onto the fronting of the altar screen, and that of course we have the colours of many of the features. The covering for the hanging pigs, 
other cloth hangings, the canopies and testers of the tombs behind the catafalque, and so on. <coughs> Likewise, the panel show Islip's monument and Chantry Chapel gives us much more detail in the colour version on the warm paintings around the chapel. and of the original colouring of the Head of Christ by Terrigiana, <coughs> sculpted in about 1520, and now at the Wallace Collection. Especially marked are the gilt bronze rays that surrounded the head, most of which are now lost. The two which do survive are apparently co covered in black varnish, but you can see them in the colour version on the left. Virtue's notes make it clear that when he examined them, there were also coloured panels of the initial letter U, which he suggests did not include the image of the building work over the top of the abbey, and of the deathbed scene. But if Virtue did versions of these, as surely he must, they don't seem to have survived. Interestingly, the only difference in the deathbed scene, this one, that Virtue mentions, is that the person that holds the crucifix to the dying abbot has a mitre on in the roll or first draft, that is, here, and in the depicted illumination it is a man in his black habit that holds it. So Thomas Beckett has been replaced by a regular monk. I am sure these features and many others will be the subject of much scrutiny in years to come, but for my purposes tonight I want to look more closely at what the new images tell us about the circumstances of the role's production and its purpose. In this context, the most telling difference between the two sets of images is on the picture of Islet's chapel. In Virtue's colour version of this picture, a scroll has been added to the bottom of the panel. This scroll, scroll bears the legend Mercy and Grace, repeated on either side of an eagle, which holds in its mouth another scroll on which is written the, word, the single word Fulwell. It is the inclusion of this detail which convinces me that Anstice's colour panels were the original finished version of the role. In 1532, when John Islip died, Brother John Fulwell was a very senior figure at Westminster. He had entered the Abbey in 1508 under Islip's patronage, and like his master before him, rose steadily through the ranks of monks. By the 1530s, he had become treasurer, cellarer, warden of the manors of Queen Eleanor, and of Richard II and Anne of Bohemia, and of Henry V. In the 1520s, he had been responsible for the payments for the decoration of Abbot Islip's own chapel, recently constructed. And he had served as the abbot's chaplain, in which capacity he was responsible for organising the furnishings of the new lady chapel. For example, in 1526, he paid eleven pounds five shillings to the sculptor Benedetto de Rovezzano for one third of the overall price of the new altar. He even owned the old manuscript. Peter House Manuscript 285 at Cambridge University Library is a small copy of the Manipulus Florum and was owned and inscribed by him. This is inscription. Not only with his name at the bottom, John Fulwell but also with the motto which adorns the Islip role, Mercy and Grace, in the middle. And with a play on words on his name, rather reminiscent of Islip's Rebus, plain as Fons, you see top left, and Valde Bene, both of which might be rendered as full well. As such, it was only natural that in 1532, full well was chosen one of the three months tasked to notify Henry VIII of the death of the abbot. In the aftermath of Islip's death, and the uncertainty around who would succeed him, John Fulwell would have certainly felt himself a, or possibly the, leading candidate for the role. However, the appointment was long delayed, and the uncertainty at the Abbey increased. These were difficult times. On the 15th of March, 1532, Archbishop Warham had publicly upbraided the King in Parliament. But two months later, in fact, the day before Islip's funeral, 
He presided over the convocation, which surrendered its legisl legislative independence to the Crown. On the same day, Thomas More resigned the Chancellorship and withdrew from public politics, starting down his own fateful path. At Westminster, John Fulwell, in his Treasurer's Accounts of Allowances for 1531 to 2, records very sizable payments that year for hospitality, what would now be described as first as advocacy or even lobbying, for the visits of various barons of the Treasury and other royal officials. Thomas More is noted that year at the end of the list, but his name has been crossed out. The Abbacy at such a time might be seen as a poisoned chalice, but I think there is no doubt that Fulwell both desired and actively sought it. On the 16th of October 1532, five months after Islip's funeral, Fulwell wrote to the ascendant Thomas Cromwell as master of the King's Jewels. Sir, please have it your good mastership to understand that all things in the sanctuary, as well within the monastery as without, is continued in due order according to the advertisement ye gave unto me when I was last with you at London. So that at the time of your return home, I trust your mastership will not hear, but that we shall deserve the king's most gracious favour in our suit. And in the meantime, my religious father prior, with all the convent, which lowly doth commend them unto you, beseecheth you of your goodness to have their matter in remembrance as ye shall so think convenient for the furtherance of the same. And ye so doing shall bind them and me assuredly to pray for your prosperous continuance, as knoweth our Saviour Jesus Christ. What exactly this suit was, he doesn't specify. But I think it's quite likely that it included as part of it the Islip role, not only as the notification of the former abbot's death, but within it also an allusion to Fulwell's desire to take on the abbacy. That is, that it was the Islip roll which served both as the notification and Fulwell's pitch for, for supremacy within the abbey. It is traditionally stated that mortuary rolls of this sort, of which only a couple of dozen survive in this country, were intended for circulation to heads of other religious houses to inform them of the death of a brother abbot or someone similar. I would argue that in this instance at least, that is not the case. This role was intended for the king, hence the employment of a very high quality and presumably expensive artist. Unfortunately, I have found no documentary smoking gun of authorship. Frustratingly, Fulwell's accounts as treasurer do not survive for the relevant year, 1532-3, even if payment for such work was recorded in them. Horenmoot, a painter, a painter from Ghent, worked for many years at the Henry Slew Court. He was an artist who worked in a wide range of media, portraiture, windows, embroidery, and manuscripts. He was probably in England by the late 1520s, and he or his workshop seemed perfectly plausible candidates. But I'm afraid there is no firm evidence one way or the other, and the new George Virtue drawings, being clearly of a lesser quality than the Isaac Roll, do not help to clarify this. John Fulwell's ambition to succeed Islip prompted him to insert both obscure and overt references to himself into the panels. As we have seen, in the opening panel, the escutcheons display Islip's own arms alongside that of his patron and the abbot for whom he had served as chaplain. The parallels with Fulwell and Islip would have been clear to anyone with a knowledge of the abbey. On the coloured chapel panel, he has, of course, gone as far as adding his name and personal motto, which is fairly blatant. Might we expect to find other evidence of Fulwell advertising himself? Well, on the deathbed scene, for which there is no surviving coloured copy, in the foreground, before Islip's bed, a small group of monks gather to offer prayers. In reality, such a grouping would surely have included Islip's own chaplain. In the drawing, the figures in this group, especially the leading figure second from the left, are rendered beautifully, with an authenticity not evident in other figures on the roll, not even in the figures of Islip himself. 
I would suggest that in this most prominent figure, we have a portrait of John Fulwell, praying for his master, but also perhaps with one eye outward to the intended viewer, to Thomas Cromwell and to the king. Whatever Fulwell's ambitions, they were to be thwarted. The interregnum at the Abbey lasted precisely one year. On the 12th of May, 1533, on the anniversary of John Isaac's death, William Boston, an obscure and presumably malleable monk from Peterborough, took the oath in chancery to perform the duties of Henry VII's foundation. He was the first outsider from the monastery to be given the abbacy since 1214, over 300 years before. Within months, much abbey property was mortgaged off to fund payments to Cromwell. Devastating financial mismanagement followed and the monastery fell into a decline until the almost inevitable dissolution of 1540. Boston himself, however, was rewarded by being appointed dean of the new collegiate church. Nonetheless, Fulwell's ambitions hadn't wavered. In 1535, three years after Isaac's death, the wealthy mercer and future mayor of London, Robert Gresham, sought from Cromwell the favour for John Fulwell, monk bailiff of Westminster, to be prior of Worcester. But nothing came of this either. Fulwell died, still a monk of Westminster, later that year. And so perhaps it is fitting that what survives of John Fulwell's ambitious but ultimate, ultimately unsuccessful project is only the sublime preparatory drawing rather than the finished work. What remains is not only an unparalleled view of the Abbey before the dissolution, greatly enriched now by the discovery of these new coloured views, but also a glorious monument to failed ambition. Thank you very much.